So good morning and welcome everyone to New Jersey Cybersecurity Conference 2021 for the session training the next generation of cybersecurity researchers. It's my pleasure to introduce the panel members and the moderators of the session. First, Dr. Santosh Nagraket, Associate Professor and Undergraduate Program Director, Department of Computer Science, Rutgers University, New Jersey. Dr. Christy Nelson, Assistant Research Professor from Rutgers University, New Jersey. Dr. Edward Moskal, Associate Professor, Department of Computer and Information Science, St. Peter's University, New Jersey. And we have moderators and session organizers. So Dr. Susan Witzel, Professor, Department of Computer Science, Stevens Institute of Technology, New Jersey. Dr. Manfred Minimeyer, Professor, Department of Mathematics and Computer Science, Seton Hall University, New Jersey. And myself, Shajina Anand, Assistant Professor, Department of Mathematics and Computer Science, Seton Hall University. Overall, the session will be for 50 minutes. The panel members will be covering the first 30 minutes, 10 minutes each, where they will touch upon the recent trends in cybersecurity and the areas that students and researchers can focus on. Followed by this, there will be a panel discussion for 20 minutes. So I'm sure the session will be insightful for all of you. So we'll get started with Dr. Santosh. Santosh, over to you. Can you all see my screen? Yes, it looks good. That's all good. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about how program safety is paramount for security in this message in this talk. So what is program safety? A program that protects its own abstraction uh, is uh, tend to be safe. And if you violate program safety, you can have catastrophic consequences. And one of the things you will notice is most security vulnerabilities arise from violations of safety. So now if you look at um, uh, vulnerability reports, majority of the vulnerabilities arise from having, uh, with your software being written in low level languages like C and C++, which do not provide memory safety. So no one wants to write programs in C, but it's, you know, if you look at every system, it has C code. And C is like this cockroach of programming languages, right? So it expects you to be an expert programmer, know everything uh, about various corner cases and handle it gracefully. A simple programming mistake can have catastrophic consequences. A buffer overflow, uh, an attack surface, attack surface for an attacker to attack. Similarly, you have a use after free error, uh, attacker can attack it. So simple programming errors can become can have catastrophic consequences. The key, the underlying heart of the problem is if you have a pointer or a reference P somewhere in the middle of the program, what regions of memory can it legally access? And there is one definition according to the standard, and then if you are a regular programmer, you may get this information wrong and you may do uh, uh, invalid accesses. And this can be exploited by the attack. So there are techniques out there today to enforce complete safety to see. So my group has built like hardware and software uh, techniques to enforce complete memory safety. So it comes with a cost, and we, the goal is to make this cost as minimal as possible. So Intel uh, adopted some of the approaches that we proposed and has memory protection extensions on their chip, uh, hardware and software acceleration uh, to co provide complete memory safety. So the part of the issue is uh, the people who are writing C code are not aware of uh, these mechanisms and they write C code without having a security mindset. So these are the safety mechanisms that we need to use. So as a result, we have a lot of security vulnerabilities. One of the educational opportunities that I would uh, suggest is to we should dissuade uh, people from writing C code and even those who want to write C code should be using safety mechanisms such as address sanitizer and define as checker. 
And more importantly, there are modern systems languages that can be used today to um, write like low level codes. For example, Rust is an example. We as educators should train uh, and educate uh, the next generation of programmers to use these modern systems languages. So the first message is one of the reasons you have your own, your programs are not safe is because you're writing in low level code, which does not protect its own abstraction. So there are, you don't have mechanisms to protect its own abstraction. The second reason is there's a lot of, even if your programs are correct, you rely on a lot of other uh, software components and hardware components, like your operating system, your compilers. For example, to enforce memory safety, uh, we built a memory safety transformation, which I uh, indicate as soft bound and search within the LL LLVM compiler. LLVM is a mainstream compiler used by almost every company right now. So how do you trust the compiler? And compilers are 7 million lines of code and similarly operating systems, right? So one way to do that is to test or do various kinds of testing, unit testing, regression testing, and randomized testing. And they have been successful with compilers. They have found like thousands and thousands of bugs with mainstream compilers. There are two things that, that can happen when you have a bug, right? Your software crashes. Uh, that's not a, uh, it's a availability issue, but it's not a serious security issue. The second thing is your compiler and silently produces wrong code. As a result, what happens is now you have a huge attack surface, a surface for an attack. So now, how do we make such low-level systems, like a large software components, correct by construction? So one of the projects that we have been looking at is pushing formal verification uh, for low-level systems um, uh, adoptable by mainstream programmers. So what is formal verification? Formal verification shows that your software is correct for all inputs. What does testing do? It shows your software satisfies a property for a specific input. So if you, if you can develop, use mathematical reasoning tools and show uh, your software is correct for all inputs, now like you have much more richer guarantees. You reduce the attack surface significantly. Uh, but requiring things, doing like formal verification for large systems used to take a lot of effort. Like and mainstream programmers who are uh, who are like pressed for time would not adopt such techniques. So one of the things that we have done uh, in my group is to design a domain specific language so that it makes writing uh, for it makes form formally verifying your code much more easier. So let's say you have a collection of optimizations and historically they are known to be very buggy. So we have a domain specific language for them. The programmer just specifies the optimizations in them. Our underlying interpreter automatically checks its correctness using a math based reasoning and then also generates C++ code which performs the optimization. So how this to alive automatic LLVM instruction combined verifier is a specification and an implementation language. So by having such abstractions, we can push formal methods into the tool chain of developers. And um, you can read more about Alive from my um, web page. But uh, one of the things, one of the cool things that has happened in the last five years is since we built Alive, like it's now widely used by almost every company that uses LLV. And it, it, it has prevented a lot of incorrect optimizations from getting into the LLVM compiler in the first place. So the, the key message that I want to uh, emphasize so one way to check program safety, which is paramount for security, is to use formal verification. It used to be a niche area a long time ago, but now there are tools and techniques that are mature and available for widespread adoption. And we need to educate and teach both the students and next generation of programmers to use them. So for example, if you're writing distributed systems, you're specifying properties of distributed, use TLA+, plus. it's pretty awesome. Similarly, if you're writing cryptographic implementations, use uh, Rust-based specification language Hackstack and SAW and other tools that are available. And we should also, apart from formal verification, we should also uh, educate people about unit testing, integrated, integration testing, and random testing at all layers. So uh, one of the ha hallmark projects, one of the recent flagship projects uh, that demonstrates the success of uh, formal verification has been the DARPA High Assurance Cyber Military Systems uh, Verified uh, Software Vehicle Software. Uh, so uh, they developed the software for these vehicles using formal methods, and they got the red team to hack into it, but they couldn't. So this shows there is like if you're developing critical software and use formal verif verification, there is um, there is an opportunity to make your system secure. That said, like if you're looking for employment opportunities, almost every company uses formal methods extensively now. Amazon has a separate automated reasoning group. Microsoft has a huge team. Uh, working on lots of applying formal methods in almost every aspect. 
So similarly, like many other companies, Google and others have their own formal method teams. So we should educate people on formal methods to avoid security vulnerability. So uh, rather than being just being an attacker creating vulnerabilities, one of the things we should inculcate in the security community is to educate, to prevent these attacks from happening in the first place at all. Uh, prevent these attacks from happening at all. So there are a lot of uh, cool work by the community and by my group. If you're interested, uh, look at the projects from my group. I'll be happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Santosh. Uh, so we will ask questions and take questions from the audience uh, after we have all the presentations. With that, I'd like to actually uh, hand the torch to Christy. Perfect. Good. All's working. Sorry, I didn't unmute. Um, good morning. So are we good with the slides? Yes. OK, awesome. So um, I am an assistant research professor at Rutgers and am currently the uh, curriculum coordinator of the Professional Science Masters in Cybersecurity and the director of the MBS um, Masters of Business and Science Externship Exchange Program. Um, so what I'm going to be talking to you this morning is about really experiential learning experiences for students um, in a variety of formats. Um, so I have been doing this for about a decade and I've worked with students in a lot of different ways and I've really been able to see the importance of students being able to get hands on experience, but also in a way that partners um, either with real research or with um, the industry. So one of the ways that I have done this is through um, what's called a research experience for undergrads. And so if there's any students on, there's, you know, I'm showcasing a variety of ways you can get involved. But if there's anyone from um, academia, these are some ways to get your students involved. Um, so the REU programs are really um, mentor typically summer long programs for undergrads that are funded through a research project and or uh, the National Science Foundation. Um, and the National Science Foundation actually has a website for students to find um, lots of different opportunities like this. In addition, I've worked with funded students through actual research projects um, where they're working for a year or a semester or um, however long the um, position is on different funded research projects, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, I've also started and currently run um, a collaborative industry externship program for both master students and then we expanded it to include undergrads. Um, and I'll get into this in a little more detail as well, but this is really working with outside companies or government agencies or nonprofits. Um, where I work with them to come up with a semester long project that's hands on for students. They're learning something. It's not doing day to day work. They're working in a team and they're getting mentoring from both a professor and um, a mentor from the company or government agency. Um, they meet once a week in a team and it's really kind of a project based program that runs in one semester so they can say this is what I've done start to finish. Um, I've gotten these kinds of skills in this kind of um, project. Um, and these are unfunded opportunities, but these are the things that often are what students are actually talking about in, in, in interviews um, because it's where they've really gotten hands on experience that they can talk about um, both in terms of technical skills as well as um, the soft skills like working in a team. Um, doing presentations every week on what they've been working on um, and running a meeting and project management. So um, that's another way. Um, and then in addition, I've mentored students on putting together both professional papers and presentations at different venues um, like INFORMS, the R RSA conference, through their security scholars, IEEE, um, IISE and, and more. Um, and then, uh, as I said, I'm the curriculum coordinator for the uh, Rutgers Professional Science Masters in Cybersecurity, where I did um, 
a little bit of a curriculum reform based on uh, demand that we were seeing through the industry as well as a need from students. Um, and this came out of surveys and discussions with experts in the industry, a labor analysis, um, and a lot of research um, to see what um, what some areas were that we cannot impact that weren't already being met at the time. Um, so as I said, I involve students in experiential projects, and I feel this is really important in training them um, both to the student, but is also value added adding to the industry partner. The students bring kind of a new perspective um, and really a lot of excitement to the projects that they work on. So some of the projects that I've done in different formats, um, you'll hear from uh, or have heard fr from Mike Garrity this, I think this morning, um, but I've partnered with the NJ Kick um, through training students on AWS, Looker, Chronicle, BigQuery, really kind of a technical hands-on series of projects. Um, I've also done Homeland Security related projects um, relating to criminal justice and or anti-terrorism. Um, and so this is something that is really related to cybersecurity, but sometimes isn't formally taught um, the criminal justice aspect. So um, I think this is another really important area and I'll get into this in our curriculum, but um, I've worked doing um, a project with Homeland Security on anti-terrorism at stadiums, um, with a nonprofit doing anti-trafficking on public transit and things like digital forensics training uh, with the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center and Homeland Security. Um, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center is policing um, and the training of police um, who come there from all over the country. I also have done security related analytics projects, uh, supply chain risk projects um, with the Coast Guard and, and information sharing, which um, was with different industries and, and, and especially the maritime industry and thinking about how to share information about attacks and other things that are going on um, in the day to day in an anonymous uh, safe way. Um, so these are with a variety of partners, the New Jersey State Police, the Coast Guard, um, Homeland Security, and then other partner examples through our extern the externship program are with, you know, company PSC and G, who I think you'll hear from today, um, DARPA doing cyber vulnerability simulations, uh, Siemens and the Rutgers Police um, and, and more. So an example of a research project that led to, we involved students and then it led to further um, expansion of our program was um, a project with the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center and Digital Forensics. Um, and this was really analyzing training and certification requirements for digital forensics, for Homeland Security investigative units, as well as um, state and local law enforcement. And so, we worked with the Law Enforcement Training Center to identify gaps in digital forensics training specifically. Um, and from there, we recommended different training and certification pathways to begin to help standardize training and certifications across Homeland Security. And so when we did this, it was a several year long project. We interviewed um, and surveyed practitioners from different areas within DHS. Um, um, we created a database of more than 200 training options in this space. And what we were seeing is that it's really not standard at this point. I mean, some of the training options are things like um, very short one hour videos through any, you know, you can get a PhD in cybersecurity um, relating to um, digital forensics. So it really ran the gamut. Um, and so we're trying to put together what are the options and, and if you want to be a professional in this space, how do you um, build up your skills over time? Um, and in doing that, we also found a gap um, in cyber forensics training for judges. And so we worked with a team um, of experts throughout the country to put together a white paper in that, on that topic as well. Um, but in doing this, we, we involved um, REU students who are undergrads, um, undergraduate capstone students who really got excited about the digital forensic space, um, and then undergrad and master students as externs for a semester. Um, and so this actually led to four different 
cybersecurity pathways within the professional science master's cybersecurity program um, and also led us to think about recruiting students from the law enforcement military background um, policy and even the legal fields because a lot of times in cybersecurity students are coming from IT or computer science but we wanted to expand that and so you could see I'll give a quick overview of these different pathways but some of the ones that we added from that um, project and from talking to experts were digital forensics especially because we were seeing that criminal justice students and people coming from law enforcement or military were really interested in the security aspect of cybersecurity, but they didn't have um, necessarily the IT or um, programming skills. So we wanted to tailor to them. Um, and then we were getting also some students with a lot of experience, maybe in policing, um, and, but they were interested more in management and then um, other areas as well. So building off of those, um, I started a program, as I talked about earlier, um, par partnering up students with the industry. Um, partners could be government, could be um, for profit, and the program has really taken off. We have about 175 students this semester alone with 50 student project teams and 40 partner organizations, and these are all unpaid projects. So you see, as you can see, this is really um, taken off from student interest as well. Um, and so you could see a quick example of a trafficking project that students did relating to data science, but also had a security element as well. So with that, um, I'll wrap this up and you can see um, the websites. If you want to hear more, I'll put them in the chat as well. So I'll hand it back to Suzanne. Thank you so much. You so, much. Christy. so we will move on to our last speaker and we'll hand the torch to Ed. OK, thank you very much, Suzanne. Let me uh, grab the screen share here and we shall start up. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yep. OK, awesome. So I'm Ed Moskal from St. Peter's University. Uh, my background is um, 24 years in IT. The last uh, 10 was with Ernst & Young out of New York, where I ran the New York office application controls and security practice. And then I pivoted uh, 19 years ago to work in education. I'm a professor at uh, St. Peter's University and really um, helped build a master's program in cyber, the undergraduate program, as well as the ecosystem uh, that I'd like to go through with you and talk about some uh, topics for papers and projects that we have uh, had students work on through the years. So uh, with that said, let's uh, hop into the presentation. So this is our ecosystem um, for our cyber center, and it consists of a number of domains. And some of the important ones I just want to call out are the education ones where we have internships and workshops and seminars and test beds. We have a club and then outreach also with the lecture series and collaborations. And then this area over here, the research area that I want to focus in on this presentation, where we have a white paper series. We work with students on publications uh, with uh, grants for the university, different uh, directed research projects with students uh, for credit and non-credit. So by bringing uh, and putting this ecosystem together, all the students can participate in these various uh, facets here, uh, leading to more skills and knowledge regarding cyber, uh, and then get them really excited about research that they could do uh, in our white paper series, as well as out in the public domain with different uh, publications that are available to them. So I just want to kind of go through uh, some of the topics that we have looked at uh, through the last few years. And some of those include uh, database security threats like SQL injection attacks and like what could be done to mitigate those attacks and distributed denial of service, uh, malware mitigation plans, uh, phishing, uh, and types of mitigation techniques for uh, that area, as well as, as, well as studies on um, 
intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems. Uh, we do a lot of work in the cybersecurity assessment area with NIST and SANS. Uh, this is really important because all companies implement these types of frameworks. So for example, in NIST, there's different subcategories. There's identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Uh, so that, that landscape is really important to understand and know. And so we have a lot focusing in on that, as well as web application pen testing. We have environments for that. Uh, we have a research lab and also ransomware attacks, which as you know, are very, very prevalent uh, today. Uh, some other topics we have are on Trojan and antivirus and password cracking and data backup and security. And uh, last but not least, really important, IoT security um, uh, regarding the threats and the vulnerabilities and what you need to do to report them to possibly a customer uh, instantaneously. So some really good topics here to share with you. Uh, and then I have some uh, call outs here with different websites in my last slide that go through uh, the Department of Homeland Security on a cyber security research guide that they have. Uh, Oxford Academic, which is a, a well-known journal, which has a lot of really good content uh, for the students that are here that are looking to do research. Uh, we have the ISEJ which is a, a nice journal to kind of maybe get your foot in the door and start to push something out and try to get something published. It's a, uh, a, a peered uh, blind review journal. So there is integrity behind that. Uh, and then I wanna show you some things about cyber attack maps, an example of a white paper, a uh, little capstone research project, and then finally meetups in cybersecurity. So let me uh, go into the internet here, and I'm not going into the, dark web, so that, that's good. And let me just hop into each of these different areas here. So first, um, I wanna hit into um, the journal, which is a roadmap for cybersecurity research. And this is a little older document, but it's still very current, right? So some of the things that the government, especially here, the Department of Homeland Security put out, uh, there's a really good, you can see the date there, November 2009. It's still current, still being used. There's a really good table of contents. It's a lengthy document. Um, so I'm not going to go through that, but this would be a good starting point to see what the DHS says regarding research in cyber and kind of create your baseline from there. Uh, we also have here uh, Oxford Academic. So that's a journal. OK, with some really good articles and content. It has all the back issues in there, so that's a good reference and source. We have the Information Systems Educational Journal, OK, which you could just go into these archives and check out all the different publications that have been provided. Uh, and then uh, the cyber attack maps. So a lot of work we do too is we, we study these maps. Uh, they're a very small percentage of what's taking place right now uh, in cyberspace, but uh, you may find this useful in looking at some of these maps and just firing them up and taking a look at the dynamic nature and what's going on. So we have uh, a list of them here. Uh, they're pretty good. And then finally, um, when we take a look at those maps, um, white papers are important uh, to kind of get your feet wet. So we have a simple format that we've implemented for a, a lecture series that we have. Um, and so I share with the students that are in our internship program and that are doing research, a, a simple framework and format for a white paper, which starts with a preface, a little information about the author, uh, and then like an introduction, okay, and then state what the problem is. So no matter what you're working on with the white paper, and we implement this white paper also for our senior capstone for graduate and undergraduate. By, uh, by the way, they also in that capstone build and launch a cyber startup company. That's part of it, along with a white paper using this format here, okay, uh, with some simple uh, notes on the bottom of each page. Uh, and it kind of wraps up with a, a conclusion 
uh, and some recommendations at the end. So that's been pretty helpful uh, in getting students going with the research. And then the couple next areas are um, a research project that uh, was done by one of our student teams. Uh, and that's this right here. So I just want to kind of fire this up real quick and, and show you this. And this is basically taking uh, some of the cyber attack maps and studying them based on certain days before certain large events that are national and international and just kind of looking and see uh, and taking some metrics on what's going on in those geographic areas. So I'll just play a couple slides through this so you can get a perspective for it kind of defines a cyber attack. And this was part of that capstone, the types of attacks. And then it kind of goes into the nits of what was done uh, in the project. Uh, and so see here, uh, are these attacks influenced by major events, right? That was like the hypothesis, what we wanted to kind of check out and study. And so we have the maps that we used. There's a couple maps. And as we roll through here, uh, we, we talk about different uh, ways these maps were used and the analytics that we collected. So uh, this was a pretty good um, area that we looked at. Uh, and so I could also share this. Uh, we looked at the Super Bowl. We looked at the nuclear security summit. We looked at the Republican presidential primary and a couple other areas within a certain timeline uh, to see if those uh, cyber attacks in those geographic areas had any impact uh, with the volume and the frequency. And then finally, uh, just talking a little bit about here, um, internships. We always we always direct students to to meetups. You can find meetups just by doing a browse. So browse by New Jersey here. I browse by Jersey City and just looking for cybersecurity, information security. There's a lot of different meetups that students can go to and engage themselves uh, in these different areas. And I'm sure there's some here also in research that um, students can take a look at and be part of uh, to learn more about you know how they can get plugged in and different types of publications and maybe even schools and organizations and individuals that want to team together to do some really cool work so with that said i'm going to take a pause and just kind of get us back to where we were here uh with the meetup and um, i'll stop my share and i will turn it back over to suzanne Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for keeping us on time. So we have about 15 minutes um, to take questions and uh, have a discussion. So um, what I'd like the audience to do is to put your questions in the chat and we'll take the questions as they arrive. In the meantime, while you get um, busy on typing, let me ask a few questions to um, the panel and to our presenters. So all three of you really talked a lot about the combination of education and research and integrating research into education in cybersecurity. So why do you think this is so important that we do this, that we stress this with our students in particular in cybersecurity? We probably don't see this in the similar kind of a stressing and interest in, in other disciplines. So what do you think is so specific and special about cybersecurity that we have to really integrate this research type thinking into the educational experience? So I could lead off with that. Just uh, that that's really important, the integration of the research and the educational experience. So it's kind of mimicking what's going on in the business world. So if you work in the industry and in IT, the more you know, the more you don't know. And you need to stay on top of every little detail, every new announcement, all the new updates to technology. And so you're actually doing your own research in industry to stay on top of what you need to do for your performance review, okay? Every every couple months uh, to produce what you need to do for your objective. So on the academic side, it looks like, you know, we're all implementing the same thing, that research needs to go hand in hand especially with cyber, data science, artificial intelligence, all these really cool technology areas that are just morphing into bigger and better. So I'll take a pause. 
Ed, can you do stop right. sharing on your side, please? Sure. Thank you. Christy, Santosh, do you want to add anything? Yeah, your so let me go ahead. So uh, I think like it's paramount to uh, be at the cutting edge of research in cybersecurity for two reasons, right? One, um, there is an incentive for attackers to exploit, create attacks and uh, break into systems. Why? The economics of scale, right? Like a lot of people are using connected devices. There's connectivity throughout the world. So uh, earlier, like you would, they would probably just you know, uh, break into mainframe. Attack surface was a lot smaller. But now, like uh, your watch is connected to the internet, your, uh, your uh, refrigerator is connected to the internet. So the attack surface is much more. And, and then the second thing is like now, uh, your devices are, uh, we rely on devices for a lot of things, right? Like just to, for medical devices, like pacemakers in your heart, right? So how do you ensure the safety of all this? So it's a question of life and death. So one, because it's it's economy, uh, supply and demand, like a lot more attacks. The second, it is, um, uh, it's used in situations where like people's lives are in question, right? And so this is why we need to train them much more. Like it's, it's similar to training doctors, right? Like we don't pay, we don't, we're not negligent when we are like uh, training surgeons, right? The ramifications for having mishaps in surgery, same thing, a uh, similar thing will happen uh, in the domain of cybersecurity. Yeah, and I can add to that just quickly and say, you know, one of the reasons is because technology is changing so quickly. And the, I mean, when you think about the criminology aspect, um, criminals are smart. And so as soon as something like they find something new or some new way to exploit something, they're going to do it. So, you know, both understanding what those new types of attacks are, what new technologies out there, um, but then also how the industry is working to counteract that, um, you know, you you get out of out of date really quickly if you if you're not. Um, really in touch with what's going on. So, um, you know, just a quick, because I, I see we have some other questions, so I want to leave time for that. But I think that's a great question, Suzanne. Yep. So I actually have a follow up question and then I'll turn uh, to the chat for a little while. And then when we worked it off, then we'll we'll continue. But so one of my other questions is, um, so how much how much research do you really need and when is the ideal time for the students to get into the research right so for example christy you described so many different ways of of including this experiential learning that has a research flavor and so did ed so when should students start right i think we have a number of students here with us today and uh, they've been asking questions already on the chat. So, so if they're interested in research, when should they actually start thinking about research? And 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 you know, what's the right time, right? So, I for for the projects that I either hire students to work on or have them work um, through an externship, I start working with sophomores, um, which is which is early. Um, but I've also worked with students who are in high school, who are just wanting to get some experience. So I, I think anytime you're interested, it's never too early to start. Um, some of the earlier students, like maybe they're freshmen getting ready to think about either an internship, an RU, um, or doing formal research, they start doing like Kaggle competitions or other kinds of competitions where whatever they're learning in their classes, they're putting it into action um, in different ways. So even things like that, um, hackathons, any, anything like that where they can get hands on experience. But I would say, you know, f formally, typically the, you know, sophomores is when I see a lot of students start, but they can start earlier in, in the other types of ways as well. OK, perfect. Uh, Ed, how does it work from your side in, in implementing that ecosystem that you've talked about? Yeah, so the ecosystem is right out of the box. And we encourage students to start looking at research out of the box, find a passion that they have or look into different areas. And so that ecosystem provides that content. So there's executive speaker presentations, there's boot camps, there's seminars, there's conferences. We so we want everybody to engage and be part of a team that will have some dynamic uh, enthusiasm to get the students on that track. 
And we also have a, a really good club that we meet every month. Uh, we do projects through that. And so I just I would just say to the students, find find different boot camps and opportunities within your school to go to to learn more about and find something that you really have a passion for. And then if you have a passion for it, you'll have the desire to do some research. And it doesn't have to be initially something, you know, a peer review it could be something simple, simple white paper, get that going. Maybe you want to lob it out there. Let's start a white paper for the cybersecurity uh, major. And let's get that up on the website so everybody can see the great work everybody's doing. So I would just say, look for that passion. Uh, the more you know, the more you don't know. Um, and just go for it. Because at the end of the day, it's going to help you. You're going to be able to put that on your resume. You'll be able to talk to talk and walk the walk in an interview. Okay. Uh, and then that'll help you with your ticket to punch in a job. Perfect. And I, I can add to that also and say that you know, for for students who may be feeling like I don't know what I'm passionate about yet, just try something if you know, you'll learn as much from what you don't like, you know, OK, I don't like that area. Let's mm -hmm. let's try something different. But the main thing is to to just get started. Um, and and all of those experiences, even if they're not the area you want to get into, will will help to guide you to to what you are passionate about. Because I'm going to be honest, as, as an 18 year old, I had or a 19 year old, I had no idea what, <laughs> what I would end up doing. So just get started. And yeah, we had a group that wrote a program that they put up on for the 99 cent app where it was the Snapchat. And there was a way that, you know, depending on your phone, that Snapchat, when you swipe it, it does not get deleted from the phone. So they worked on an app that they created that would then erase that, you know, uh, clearing up your phone and uh, wiping it. So, and so mm -hmm. if you're interested in social media, there's all kinds of cool things that you have no idea what's still lingering out there, right? Mm -hmm. So that could be a cool area to check out and say, say to your friends, hey, you know, I got this cool app and yeah. you know, you'll be safe with whatever you're doing out there in the social world. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So let me let me move over to the chat. Uh, let's take two or three chat questions. The first one that we received is, what are the effective pedagogy approaches to practice or develop a cybersecurity expert? Do we have any takers, any? Oh, let me go ahead and uh, just mm -hmm. give them a brief overview. Cybersecurity is a broad term, right? So. Uh, it ranges from usable security. So as an end user, like how do you make sure your systems are safe to enterprise security where like you are dealing with cloud scale systems and then like a communication security and network security, all these come into the picture. So the first thing that uh, that should be inculcated in any uh, curriculum is to uh, the basic uh, principles of usable security, right? Majority of that time, like why is your computer part of a botnet? Primarily because you took a, a bad app from an Android store, Angry Birds Star Star, and installed it in your machine. It's like uh, getting a, a criminal from the road, oh, from the road on, uh, into your house and giving him access to your house, right? So the first thing like we should educate people is what are the basic principles? How you can be safe? Like how how do you browse? safely on the web? How do you put, how do you design effective password? How do you ensure this is, this is like 101. Like, oh, it's strangely that we don't even teach our undergraduates, like freshmen, <laughs> about these basic principles to stay, in, stay safe in an interconnected world. So this should be in like 101 of your course, right? Then as you go further, like if you now you're looking at um, uh, specifically like system level security. So you need to understand what are the, why are, systems being hacked into. So you should understand how systems are built, like what are the effective measures. And as you go like into sophomore years, you should like you should have testing because like majority of the time, like how do you discover attacks? Because someone is, uh, these attacks happen because uh, they are being tested with inputs that no one has seen. And finally, like when you get, get to your senior years in the program, uh, you, that's where you look at like, um, uh, enterprise level security, like communication security. How do you use effective cryptographic uh, protocols to uh, design communications? Uh, how do you design effective uh, uh, mechanisms for protecting yourself? What are the appropriate access control policies? So I think it's not, there is no one way to uh, become a security expert, right? So it goes in stages. So I would say like take a staged approach 
uh, incorporate this in various parts of your curriculum. Hopefully, by the end of it, like you are in reasonably good shape to look at cutting edge of research. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So we have a few more questions, so I will go through them quickly and uh, I'll ask for a quick answer so that we can hopefully fit many of them in. We have only four minutes left. One question was about, um, there was mention to uh, train judges in cybersecurity or aspects of cybersecurity and uh, the person is interested in possibly going to law school with a background, a certificate in cybersecurity and a major in economics. Is that a valuable, interesting, a good path to pursue? Maybe Christy, you wanna you wanna take that? Sure. So I will say when when I talked about training judges in cybersecurity, they're not actually doing the cybersecurity. They're understanding the terminology, the lingo, um, some of the nuances in listening to some of the cases that are being presented. So even things like um, preserving the chain of custody of evidence when it's digital instead of a physical, you know, somebody's shirt or something like that, it's very different. Um, so when we when we talk about training them, it's really training them in terminology, not in actually doing um, the cybersecurity. But one of the things that um, came out of that really is the vast amount of data that they're both the district attorneys as well as the judges are having to deal with because when you think about digital evidence it's evidence from your phone from a gps in a car you know all of these different devices that everyone has and there's so much data and so part of that is really understanding how to navigate the amount of data in a way that you know, meshes with the criminal justice system and the tools that they have. Um, and so, you know, part of that, I would say, if you're interested in in going to law school, um, maybe to even think about taking um, a few data science courses just to understand how to navigate the vast amount of data coming from cybersecurity because you're not going to actually be doing the cybersecurity you're going to be looking at the evidence from it so i think that's a distinction there um, but if you're interested in the criminal justice area then you know you can obviously take classes and training in the forensics tools that they use um, but remember, you're you're not preventing an at attack necessarily. You're getting evidence from an attack for the court system. That helps. Perfect. So um, I want to add just two, you know, uh, points on this. In our cybersecurity program on the undergraduate level, we've had now a number of students who finished with a bachelor's in cybersecurity and actually went on to law school. I think it's a very cool combination if you're passionate about both. And I think it's something that's very important and very much needed that you have lawyers, that you have judges later on that actually understand the technical aspect. And so, you know, if you're passionate about the law field, and in our case, the students really kind of discover that through a course that we have in IT security and law, I think that's a perfect path to pursue. So maybe the last question, uh, because we're absolutely running out of time, even though we have quite a few uh, questions left on the stack, and uh, I'm going to pitch that over to Ed, is what certifications should I start out on if I'm looking on joining the cybersecurity field in general? Uh, because Ed, you you mentioned that you came from Ernst & Young, EY, and so maybe maybe you know that's something that, that you can give some advice on. Okay, really cool. So there's a, there's a link, uh, cyberseek org and what that is it's part of the nice framework and it has a map a dynamic map you can click on a state and it shows you the different jobs and the roles and the titles by geographic area and by the framework and then in the bottom right quadrant it'll show you all the different main certifications that companies are looking for when they hire somebody a lot of them are the comp tia like network plus security plus which are the basics which some of the curriculums at the schools that you're at are probably teaching to that. So you can probably sit in and take those. So that's there. Uh, other ones, uh, SANS, ISACA, some of that you need more experience. So the CompTIA is a really good launching pad uh, to get that. That's a really valued uh, certification. I also just put in the chat box IQ4. 
uh, is offering a free virtual internship to anybody that's participating in this conference. It starts November 2nd. It's a, uh, I think a six or eight week internship meets once a week for two hours. Uh, you will be put in a team with other students of uh, five to seven students with a job role, okay? Uh, a cyber job role with different uh, skills and knowledge that you'll be working on to acquire. And you make presentations to industry employers and mentors once a week with the teamwork deliverable that you work on. It's all cyber case based. So you may want to check that out. And thank you, Christy, for putting that link in there for CyberSeek. So back I'm over to that you. one. That's a great recommendation. <laughs> yep, it is. So I think this is really, you know, ending on a very high note and uh, very important uh, information. So thank you very much, everyone for coming to our session. Thanks to all the presenters for doing such a marvelous job uh, with the individual elements and then also fielding the questions. Thanks again. I'm sure that if you have further questions, if you would like to get in touch with uh, the presenters, they're happy to you know, work with you and, and, and uh, potentially also meet up with you, you know, in a virtual way if uh, uh, there is a greater discussion. And so thank you very much for being here and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.